Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 527 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 17th of January 2021 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking about co-writing with artificial intelligence tools with Yudinjaya Widjaratni, a Sri Lankan author who co-wrote his novel The Salvage Crew with a number of AI tools including GPT-2 and he was able to cut down his writing time by several months, talks about it in a, in a joyous manner and got a book deal with a traditional publisher and the audiobook is narrated by Nathan Fillion from Firefly and Castle fame and uh, if you know Nathan Fillion you'll be like oh exciting as I did. <laughs> so Yuda talks about how he co-created the book and how we can think of co-writing with these tools, co-creating with these tools rather than the idea of AI taking our jobs. Uh, so this is a fascinating conversation. Of course there are plenty of challenges with technology but he talks Talks about it being incredibly freeing to co-write these, to co-write this way, and it was a joyous three months. I never had writer's block, and it sped up the creative process uh, once the tools were written. Anyway, and of course, we'll talk about all that. Uh, we also consider the question: What does it mean for art if art can be automated and humans can't perceive the difference? <laughs> So again, we have, um, you know, I'm jolly about this. I'm upbeat about this. And uh, Yuda is, uh, has a lot of deep knowledge that I don't have. So some of my questions hopefully will be like your questions. Um, since Yuda wrote The Salvage Crew, which is actually out. So obviously it was a couple of years ago when he, he did this. The language models have been getting better. Uh, GPT-3 is 100 times more powerful than GPT-2, which is what he used. And go back and listen to episode 518 if you want to revisit the basics of natural language processing. And of course, technology keeps improving. So even uh, just as I was researching the introduction to this, Google announced a model that is six times bigger again than GPT-3. And uh, Yuda talks about some of the challenges of this particular technology, but there is a group who is trying to reconstruct something like GPT-3, but make it open source called eleuther.ai. And this is really interesting because, as I say in the in the interview, OpenAI is now working with Microsoft as licensing their work to Microsoft. So these tools are going to appear within the Microsoft uh, ecosystem. But personally, I don't use Microsoft. It might be something that came in, but uh, I'm, I'm an Apple girl. <laughs> so it's this is very interesting. Uh, if you want to learn more about writing with AI, I'm actually keeping a list of the various tools and software companies and possibilities available to us. You can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash future and you'll find the links to all the various episodes and also my list of tools and resources and books and uh, things like that. So that's thecreativepen.com forward slash future. I have been playing with some of these tools myself. Uh, this week, I used InfoKit, which is one of the possibilities to train a model on my own books. So essentially, I uh, saved my books as a text file, removed the back matter and uploaded it to a custom model through In InfoKit. And it was pretty terrible. <laughs> It really was. It was useless. It was basically useless. And the reason why is because my books alone, and I have like 17 novels, but that's nothing. That is not enough to train a data, uh, a, you know, a, a, an algorithm to do anything particularly useful. Uh, so I then had to go by supplementing it with some Gutenberg out of copyright books. But again, it's still not enough, particularly because InfoKit has a... Um, uh, an upper limit on the amount of data you can use. So then I did try and play with the main model. You can actually do this at InfoKit. Uh, again, links in the show notes. And it's built on, you're going to laugh, <laughs> Megatron 11B, which I thought was quite funny. And the largest publicly available 
language model created by Facebook with 11 billion parameters. Now, <laughs> the fact that it was created by Facebook, I mean, I still think there are lots of problems with potential copyright issues. And but and at the moment, I'm certainly not intending to do anything other than play with this. But I am going to be talking to some people in coming weeks who were doing other things. And it was actually a lot of fun. And I got some really interesting creative output. So my goal is to really try and learn how to use these tools and over time, hopefully talk about it with, with you, show you how to do it, maybe do some tutorials. Because what's interesting is uh, I'm not a programmer, so I'm not going to do something like Yuda does. Uh, but it is an area that is only going to become more interesting for all of us. And we, we use tools. We all use tools. You know, I use Scrivener. I use the internet. I read loads of books. I use other people's brains. I use the internet already. So I see this as some kind of iteration. So anyway, there will be more discussions on this. So the interview with Yura is coming up. In publishing news, Amazon.com and the Big Five publishers, Penguin Random House, Hachette, HarperCollins, Macmillan and Simon & Schuster, although perhaps that will be Big Four this year, Simon & Schuster moves into Penguin Random House. But anyway, Amazon and the Big Five have been accused of colluding to fix ebook prices, as reported in The Guardian this week. It names Amazon as the sole defendant, but labels the publishers co conspiracy co-conspirators even. <laughs> it alleges Amazon and the publishers use a clause known as most favoured nations to keep ebook prices artificially high by agreeing to price restraints that force customers to pay more for ebooks purchased on retail platforms that are not Amazon.com. Now, this is interesting in the one sense, but to be honest, as indie authors, this doesn't apply to us because <laughs> most of our ebooks are not expensive or artificially high. And in fact, many would say they're too cheap. So uh, this is not about us, but this is part of the whole move into more reg regulation and looking at uh, big tech. What is interesting is this article says... The lawsuit claims that almost 90% of all ebooks sold in the US are sold on Amazon, in addition to over 50% of all print books. That's interesting <laughs> because I knew it was a lot, like a dominant number, but that's really high. And for 50% of all print books, if it's any, if it's even anywhere near that, that's, that's incredible. And I'm not sure whether this was, this data is from pre pandemic. Obviously, people are buying a lot more print books online now. The article says the lawsuit comes a day after the state of Connecticut in the US announced it was investigating Amazon for potential anti-competitive behaviour in its sales of ebooks. Now that one, there's not. I read the article in the Wall Street Journal, and it's not that detailed in terms of what that might mean. But that I think is more interesting to us and authors, obviously published by Amazon Publishing or APUB, because that's the type of thing that is more likely to get regulated possibly. In my personal update, I'm still working on how to make a living with your writing the third edition, which is definitely more extensive than the last edition. And it's very encouraging to me that this is more extensive. There are new chapters in the book because there are more options available for authors. And the opportunities are so great that I am going deep into rabbit holes and getting ideas for my own business. And I'm expecting the book to be out in March. So yes, I'm pleased about that. It's good to have a project to work on as our lockdown here in the UK may well be going on for the foreseeable future. And of course, I have days when I'm pretty miserable about that, but I try and just drown myself in work. <laughs> <laughs> which helps. In terms of books, Map of Shadows, Map of Plagues are now on Audible. If you want to uh, listen to my dark fantasy, Map of the Impossible, the third in the trilogy is almost there. They are also on the other audio platforms and should be on your library apps. If you borrow from libraries, you can also buy them direct from me at payhip.com forward slash the creative pen. I'm really happy with this. I finished the trilogy last year and only once I'd finished the trilogy did I feel confident about looking for a narrator. And I'm very happy with Charlie Sanderson, female Charlie, who sounds a bit like me, but slightly younger and is obviously a professional at narrating fiction and just does a great job. Uh, so I'm really happy with the books. So yes, Map of Shadows, Map of Plagues and Map of the Impossible on the way. Your author business plan and the AI book are also on the way to Audible. But again, you can buy them from me and from other stores. 
It's still annoying how long these things take to filter through the ecosystem of audio, but such is life. So in useful stuff, if you want to master advertising for your books this year, check out Mark Dawson's Ads for Authors course, which is open now. Just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash ads, A-D-S, to use my link. I use Facebook ads, Amazon ads and BookBub ads for my book sales in various ways. And Mark's course is fantastic. I think it's the best one for understanding specifically how to use ads to sell more books. And it is updated every year when things change, which is why it is great because let's face it, these platforms change all the time. (laughs) So that is open now. Go to thecreativepen.com forward slash ads. Also, if you are getting into online courses this year, uh, you can get 50% off all my online courses with coupon LOCKDOWN in caps. And uh, that is valid at least till the end of February, but will continue <laughs> if lockdown in the UK continues. Uh, so that will that includes how to write a novel, how to write nonfiction, productivity, business plan, and how to create online courses. Uh, very meta and multiple streams of income, content marketing for fiction, and co-writing a book. So yes, just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash learn and use coupon lockdown for 50% off. And finally, very pleased to see two new directories of podcasts. Now, at the moment, I find new podcasts by searching for topics on Spotify, usually, and I will listen to episodes and might subscribe to a show. I actually these days tend to listen to many more sporadic episodes on topics as opposed to subscribing to a particular show. But um, I do have a couple I listen to. Obviously, uh, I listen to Six Figure Authors and Writers Inc. pretty much every week. Um, And I check into others uh, over time when I'm interested in a topic. But really happy to share these two new directories if you want to find podcasts to listen to. LiveWriters.com is a directory of podcasts about books, writing and publishing. And the creative pen is on there. So LiveWriters.com. And also PodcastsInColor.com, colour spelt the American way. Podcasts created by people of colour across all kinds of diverse topics. So that's podcastsincolor.com and they do have a writing and art segment in there. Links in the show notes as ever. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Thanks to Beth who sent a lovely jolly photo of herself all wrapped up and grinning as I talked about enjoying Bridgerton. She said she knew exactly what I I meant when I talked about enjoying Bridgerton. Uh, H on YouTube on last week's episode, It's Never Too Late, says, I'm 54 and have written poetry for many years, but life always got in the way of writing more. Uh, Now I'm taking a creative writing degree with Open University and loving it. Uh, I heard recently the best creative times in life are before age 10 and after 60. <laughs> well, I would I would argue that the best time is whenever you can get to it. <laughs> um, that may be when you have more time in your life to do it, of course. Uh, Alicia left a comment. She said, at times I have the opposite problem from the curses I missed my chance to make something of myself issue. Uh, I wonder whether I'm too young to write fiction or if I started too young. Then I remember that the norm in this case is not the law. What really matters is what we do with our lives, not how much or how little lies ahead or behind us. And that is a fantastic attitude, Alicia. What really matters is what is what we do with our lives today, because of course you can't know how long you're going to live. It's not something that we know. You have to make the most of it right now. And then uh, just a a couple more. Bradley Charbonneau did a walk in sub-zero temperatures and uh, sent a lovely clear blue sky picture above a forest. Thanks for guiding us into the new year. And Catherine Pope says, I'm feeling inspired by the latest episode of the show. As Joanna points out, this is no time to give up gin and wine. (laughs) Absolutely, Catherine. And I've certainly, I've almost finished my bottle of Christmas gin. So I'm not sure what that says about my gin habit. I guess it's not too bad. We're almost at a month. (laughs) Okay, right. Oh, and one on health. Health, Carlsey says, all your talk about walking has encouraged me to start walking since I can no longer run. Uh, I'm learning to love New England in January all over again. 
That's fantastic. So today's show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Uh, My patrons fund my brain. I was thinking about this. It really is. You pay for time for me to think and read, so you don't have to. (laughs) And there is a lot of that this year. In fact, uh, just this morning, so I finished my morning reading, what I'm doing in the morning now, because I have so many books that I've got. I actually have most of them in hard copy now uh, because I'm uh, underlining things. Yes, I'm defacing print books with underlines and notes and folding corners around AI, blockchain and all these different things that I'm investigating so that I can feed back to you and share with you what I learn and hopefully as we think about this next decade ahead uh, how we can be prepared for the future. So I'm actually spending more time than ever. It's probably at least an hour, possibly two hours every day in kind of chunks at different times of really getting deep into the research around this. And so I wanted to particularly thank my patrons who uh, pay just a couple of dollars a month uh, or a couple of coffees a month um, to support the show. So obviously I have corporate sponsors who pay for hosting, transcription and editing, but my time is supported by my patrons. Thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Matthew Allen, Keith and Erica Southworth, Benjamin Goodley, Sharon Bradford-Lunn and Beth Hawkins. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. It really means a great deal to me, uh, especially in these pandemic times. And you can support the show just a couple of dollars a month and get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I really have to do this week. (laughs) Lots more audio fun and you get access to the backlist and you can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Yudanjaya Wijaratni is the award-nominated author of science fiction novels, including Numbercast and The Inhuman Race, as well as a senior researcher on data, algorithms and policy for an Asian think tank based in Sri Lanka. His latest novel, The Salvage Crew, features humans working alongside an AI overseer and was written with the help of AI tools. So welcome to the show, Yuda. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's so exciting to talk to you. So let's just start by tell us a bit more about how you got into writing sci-fi novels alongside being a a tech journalist, a data scientist, doing all these things. How does your artistic life weave into your technical side? Well, the writing came first, interesting. I was always a writer first and foremost. And I started out wanting to write video games. And just after school, I was before I sort of in between working stints at retail, I was trying to I was trying to build and write JRPGs as a way of uh, uh, teaching myself the skills of both programming and also just sharpening my writing skills in general. So the two sort of went hand in hand because I never really saw a difference. Like if you consider Russell's whole line of reasoning that. Language is a way of denoting concepts and the relationships between them. There was there never seemed to be a difference between a, a language that we would speak or write and a programming language. It was just a matter of having the concept map in your head. So I, I sort of just built these two things up mutually. I, I really like that you say programming is just another language because I often feel that people who use words in the language they speak don't really understand that coding can be incredibly creative. And my husband is a programmer, so and I've worked with a lot of programmers, so I understand it. But for people who really only see language as, as sort of writing in sentences, what what do you think is the comparison like in terms of beautiful code and beautiful language versus sort of functional things? Firstly, there's as much variation, if not more, within programming languages as you would get in what we would what we would consider to be beautiful and functional languages. So, for example, if you want something that's written like a haiku and that's clean and then perfect and also at the same time a bit difficult for a beginner to understand, there's Ruby. If you want the English of programming languages, then there's then there's Python, which is Sort of a general purpose, um, he is designed to do sort of everything, but not really optimized towards any particular thing, language. If we're talking about extremely precise definitions and tight formal logic chains, then you have languages like Lisp and the Haskell family and so on. So you have these different variations, and within that you have 
all these di- styles, almost these dialects and languages spin off each other all the time. And a lot of it does correspond to what we would think of as sentences. So you have the line breaks, you have, you have the clauses that tell the term, that tell the compiler that, right, this is a self-contained unit of instructions. Let's move on to the next one. So it's a lot like, um, like when I was growing up, when I was growing up, because of the way our education system is structured, for example, to get into uh, to get into university to do a computing degree, you had to have taken maths, and maths is this bunch of A-level subjects: pure maths, applied maths, physics, chemistry. There's this whole bucket of subjects that you have to take that's considered necessary to build up the skills required to be in computing. I did maths. And then later, as I got into computing, I realized, well, actually, I would have been better served with an arts degree. Yeah. Oh. Better, even better served with a creative writing degree because it's far more akin to writing an essay to, to the machine mm-hmm. than, than it is to, you know, write rigorously defined, you know, equations that, that perfectly uh, terminate and balance each other across the equation marks and so on. Yeah, I at least get, that, that's mm. how I view it. I understand that like, others would totally be different on this. Mm. No, I totally get that. And I think it's it's almost really important to understand this idea of the art of code. And even if we don't need to code ourselves, but as we get into our discussion, so I want to get into this uh, this book you've written, The Salvage Crew, which is a fantastic science fiction novel in its own right, but fascinating also because you co-created it, I guess, with AI tools. So can you explain the process of creation in writing The Salvage Crew? Because in reading your notes, you said it was extraordinarily freeing to use these various tools. So take us through that. Sure. So what I did for The Salvage Crew was I've, I've been sort of bashing my head against um, the idea of AI writing fiction. And I've explored this in short stories, notably in, in, a, in a couple of anthologies that we've been looking at what happens to humans when, when, so when you have Shakespeare 2.0 or uh, Derrida 4 or whatever. And uh, I've sort of been approaching this problem from various angles and trying to look at it from a technical perspective of this is a pattern recognition problem and how do we make this work? And a lot of computer science seem to be to feed a neural network, um, a collection of books, and then laugh as it managed to perfectly get the rules of, say, pronunciation and spelling and grammar, but managed to hilariously mangle up concepts of time and (laughs) plot and so on and so forth. Mm. And, And it's because these are extremely complex. Like when we tell stories, there are lots of extremely complex layers that we are looking at. And these layers have patterns. In it. There, there are patterns of uh, punctuation. There are patterns of plot elements. There are patterns of character arcs and so on. So I started dialing down my ambition and instead looking to the, particularly to the video games industry to have aspects of the world building handled for me. So this is the, the story is it starts off as a, it's a combination of space opera. And a colony survival situation, I would say. So it takes place on a planet. The planet is generated by a very, very, very simple uh, uh, code structure that we would call a Markov chain. The continents, the weather, all of that is generated. There's something else that handles weather shifts that tells me what the weather is like on each chapter and does so in a realistic way so that it doesn't go from rain to thunderstorm or rain to thunderstorm too sunny to thunderstorm again, but rather rain, slightly, slightly more, slightly more rain the next day, and then thunderstorms, and then slowly clearing up and so on. The characters are also generated this way. Some of the interactions uh, in the plot uh, and some of the events of the plot itself are basically, so there's a bunch of programs that pop up and say, right, this happens, this happens. And me as an author, I look at those I look at those data points and go, right, it's saying that the the thing that's responsible for the weather is telling me that it's snow. The thing that's responsible for generating random events 
he's telling me that they're about to be attacked. And the character generator that's been triggered by the events have decided to give uh, the attackers, at least one of the attackers, adaptive camouflage. Uh, so adaptive camouflage in snow, they're going to be absolutely terrified because <laughs> they can't see where these things are coming from. And so I was able to spin that story because it was some. It was like, uh, it was not as much as AI really co-writing with me as someone constantly um, standing there holding up a never-ending stream of ideas. And every time I, it ran out of ideas, it would just bring up another card and say, have you tried this? Cool. Have you tried this? How about we try this? And the combinations of these things just keep that process of... Um, of generating story ideas, stories and subplots throughout the whole th- throughout the whole book going, and then I used um, because the book is about a machine poet. I used a retrained version of OpenAI's GPT two, which made headlines. I think I think as I remember when they they released a, a couple of articles that they said were written by GPT two. It's a very large model that's trained on a lot of data. It looked incredibly realistic. It had written an article about unicorns um, in a very sober fashion. It was almost as if the BBC was reporting on the discovery of unicorns, incredibly sober reporting. Um, fake scientists have been, re- have been referred in that small quotes and air quotes are there. And um, I basically took that and modified it to make it generate poetry. Because the the whole the main character is is a bored machine poet, so I thought it would be nice to have a real machine poet actually powering the fake machine poet. <laughs> I love that, and I think what's so interesting is having read your process and you talking about it now. You actually took all these different tools, some that you designed, some that other people designed, and used them, as you say, for the character and the plot and the different things that come up, the planet and all of this different thing. So it's like you did loads of work beforehand to create these various tools that you then use to do the writing. And when I hear you speak now, it doesn't actually sound like the machine as such did much of the writing, more that you just took all these as inputs and then created something. But of course, you mentioned GPT-2. We're now, what, 18 months on and GPT-3 has been released and presumably GTP-4 will be coming. GPT-4 will come next year or the year after whatever. So how how will because you've got a three book deal on this will you do things differently next time and how are the tools more powerful now yeah so you're you're definitely right at some point i was looking at that curve of effort to that effort to automation curve and wondering look am i am i are there not easier ways of just writing this but uh, it was done i did this because i was curious to see if it could be done and in this particular Centaur chess format almost that um, this model pushed by Gary Kasparov to see if it could be applied to writing. Uh, so for me, it was just a thrill of finding out whether it could be done. Um, as, as you said, uh, GPT-3 is out, GPT-4 is on its way. I don't think I'll be pursuing that particular hint because technically those transform architectures look like a dead end. Um, because they are incredibly sophisticated, but as as we as we understand the papers, as we look at the training costs, uh, GPT three, for example, is not something that can be easily trained or retrained without having millions of dollars worth of hardware lying around. It's it seems increasingly uh, an inefficient brute force method to take a transform architecture, throw throw so much data at it that eventually it starts doing very sophisticated pattern recognition and spitting things out that start, that looks realistic. Uh, where I'm going to go instead is actually I've written a galaxy generator and uh, I have it generating planets, I generate stars. It, it, it does a distribution quite similar to what the Milky Way has. And then it starts generating planets and assigns these planets to stars. And then it starts generating civilizational artifacts and assigning these things to the space between them. And it's visualized as a social network. So I don't necessarily need to care about the actual distances between the stars. That's not strictly relevant for a story, but the links between and the path 
that a random node might take from one end of the galaxy to the other and the things they might see on the way that that is something that i'll be digging deeper into no that sounds fascinating so i love that it's very interesting you say that the transformer architecture might be more of a dead end but of course more of these different tools are arising all the time but i know that people have and i don't want to say it's an ethical issue but there's certainly an issue and you say in your your notes what does it mean for art if art can be automated and humans can't perceive the difference so have you what do people say about that because i know some people are like well you didn't make all that stuff up out of your own mind so therefore it can't be real for example or what is the value that you can assign to art created by a machine versus a human so I know these are huge questions but what are some of the things that you've considered in this area well that's a big one I initially created this machine poet that uh, I made out of retraining GPT-2 I initially put it up as an Instagram bot and I let it generate Instagram poetry just to see if it could. And with, you know, I wrote a basic Python script that would have them um, following hashtags, well, come in liking and commenting on people's stuff, following them. If they didn't follow back, uh, they'd go and unfollow within three days. So that bot uh, was, I would say, generating stuff as good as or superior to most of what you see on hashtag Insta poetry. And it started building up a following of a very small following, but a following nonetheless of people who kept commenting, liking, and saying, oh my God, this is so meaningful. So I have in my head this graph that basically, now something something like this can could easily replicate your garden variety Insta poet. Could it generate another Tennyson's Ulysses? I don't think so. Could it do a T.S. Eliot? I, again, don't think so. So I have in my head this loose graph, and there's a line there that, that, that is constantly moving. And on one side is stuff that can be easily replicated with very little effort that can be automated, and um, people can't tell the difference. And those seem to be low energy, low effort, activities they they are almost the small talk category of art if it would if we would and then beyond that moving boundary are his work that people have put serious thought into and there's now this sharp divide of can it be automated and will people be able to tell most of the poetry for example in the savage crew um people had no idea that it was uh, generated this way because it, it makes it makes sense within the format and so on. But however, it is not as uh, it is not as thematically complex as what you might get out of uh, a Shelley poem. So, I mean, as poetry is a really good example, because we generally impose meaning on words, especially if they're less prescriptive. But generating plot and an arc of a story is something much more involved. And I guess it's it's also interesting, like you mentioned the Gary Kasparov and the centaur chess idea. To me, these are tools. Obviously, to you, these are tools. And thus, there is nothing... Um, let's use the word cheating. Like some people would say it's like cheating, right? To use some of these tools. Uh, and yeah, of course we use computers to write on and that could be considered cheating as such. Now you said there that people didn't know that that AI poetry was written by, um, a machine. But what about your publisher? Cause you've got a three book deal for the novel and the sequels and Nathan Fillion of Firefly fame, who I love performed the audio book. So clearly this is not a problem with publishers, but, um, do they know that you co-created with AI? Do you think it's acceptable in other areas outside of sci-fi? <laughs> Oof, uh, good question. So uh, in response to the cheating thing, I would say right now it's it's a lot more effort than it is just writing the book. And right now I'm doing it more or less because of my own curiosity. Um, I would say that it's not just cheating, but rather inevitable because in this space of humans and humans and machine learning and 
AI to use the term. It seems that we have we have um, tilted ourselves headfirst into narratives that pit one against the other, whether it's Rossum's Universal Robots or um, urban legends of golems running wild or Talos or Frankenstein and the hideous progeny to Arnold Schwarzenegger um, being the Terminator. It's always this machines will come to end humanity thing. However, what it's been like in reality is that um, we adapt. We tend to merge. Hybridity, in fact, is a far better thesis of working people and the machine working together. And I think this is going to be essential. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be part and parcel of our future. In the same sense as you mentioned that we use computers now which could be considered cheating to uh, a medieval scholar who has to produce his own parchment, dye it by hand, possibly survive a viking raid to find <laughs> the books that they need. The ability to just access all of humanity's knowledge in a few keystrokes would be incredible cheating compared to someone who had to go to the Delphic Oracle to get like an answer. So uh, we tend to adapt. We tend to integrate this stuff. And I think this will happen. As for whether it is, it will be acceptable outside science fiction. That I don't know. I we so the, the, the line of thinking that this comes from is I was looking at, what happened in areas where AI has actually defeated the human, the, the best performing human at the top of the field by whatever criteria. And I came across chess, uh, chess master Gary Kasparov in the, in the latter a part of the 90s, getting beaten by IBM's Deep Blue. And the headlines of those times, which I, I obviously don't recall because I was a kid, uh, but the headlines of those times were, well, Man defeated by machine. This is the end. Mm. Because here is the greatest chess master of all time for just falling. And um, and what Ka- what Kasparov did next was rather interesting. He came back years later with a field called Advanced Chess, where he said, okay, we've done human versus human. We've done machine versus machine. Let's try human plus machine versus human plus machine. And you found that it played to the natural strengths of both of these systems, really. Humans are really good at general purpose thinking. We are good at wild plays. We are good at connecting cross-domain expertise. We're not necessarily good at memorizing large tables of figures. Whereas a chess engine is basically designed to be, have that depth and have uh, all of these historic positions saved and try to make reasonable inferences as to how the battle is going to go on. So Centaur Chess saw young players who would otherwise not be operating anywhere near Grandmaster level, very amateur players, suddenly posting scores and plays that were equivalent to, if not higher than the best human or chess engine players. Like Grandmaster level plays were being done by uh, very young kids Whose talent was whose talent lay more in being able to talk to the chess engine than actually being setting up a fantastic endgame, and I think that I thought that that was actually quite beautiful because in doing in performing this kind of hybridity, we let more people into the game, we let more people perform better. Uh, we can potentially have people uh, like in this in the case of writing this book. I find that it usually takes me about a year, a year and a half to think about a book and outline and plan it and so on and so forth. This, once the programmed elements were in place, must have taken me three months. And it was three joyous months. I never hand write this block. It was always, I would sit down, I would go, right, what are we doing today? And there's a bunch of things uh, being poked at me and my mind could easily stitch a story out of them. I think there's potential there. Um, mm. 
I, I know everyone's perking up at three joyous months. I mean, that just, <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yes. <laughs> yes, instead of that, you the, instead of that, you know, hitting that wall at 50 or 60,000 words where you don't know if this is good, you don't know, you're trying to make the ends meet, you're trying to figure out whether the storyline will come together. This was just like me sitting down and going, right, we're going to have fun today. And that, I think, is the attitude. Like you've mentioned curiosity, you've mentioned fun, joyous. These are words that I want people to think of. I, I I feel that many authors are scared. As you say, it's the media has been sort of the terminator or whatever. But I want us to reframe this as, as joyous and fun and co-creation with potentially these tools that will help us use our minds in really interesting ways. So were there things that came up that you were like, wow, that's, that's actually really surprised me in taking me into a different realm than I would have done on my own. Oh yeah, to the plot elements of how they started essentially falling back and starting to keep a farm growing, and how they like at some point there are these giant. Without spoiling, there are these giant mega beasts on the horizon, and they're reverting to like medieval wood um, siege weapon construction in an effort to keep themselves protected because there's just not enough, there was just not enough uh, stats to go around. And those things are completely uh, unexpected. Almost all the encounters, were, almost all the fights that they had were completely unexpected. I had in mind the character, the main character, and I had in mind the character of the alien that they do eventually make first contact with. And I had that theory of mind set in place and everything else was basically winging. It does. It sounds really fun. So when do you think though, I mean, what I'm seeing at the moment is that there are starting to be tools, like assuming that most people listening are not programmers, I'm not a programmer. When do you think there are going to be more tools available for authors to use that uh, build on top of many of the existing things that programmers are using and the things that are in beta? Hmm. And Yeah. Hmm. So when do you think that they'll be more ready or are there any that are even ready now? So I think in terms of world building, there's quite a few tools being built around niches. There's, for example, a fantasy town generator. There's going to be universe sandbox generators. And all of these, all of these stuff already exists because procedural generation, the art of uh, taking math and turning it into these incredibly large uh, structures that we can then re- appropriate for world building, that's been going on for a long time in game development. And there are all of these like dungeon masters who run D&D games will probably be very familiar with a lot of the generators out there. The most sophisticated stuff, such as OpenAI, the reason I have to be cautious around this is that any of these AI tools, anything, anything involving machine learning requires a lot of data to be trained on so that it can then start producing things like that. The problem comes with copyright. So, for example, I would love to have something that has been fed, uh, let's say, a couple of hundred science fiction novels just to be able to give it a sentence like um, like Foucault's Pendulum, where mm. they have this oh, computer that... that- Mm. Yeah, where they have this computer that constantly keeps cranking out conspiracy theories and just uh, tying everything together into a plot. I would love to be able to do that. But the problem is that data, if it's fiction, is somebody else's copyright. Yeah, and I also see that as a problem. And I really think that there needs to be a licensing model for licensing works in copyright to be used as training data for yes. some of these yes. things. So you obviously Absolutely. work in policy. So how, I mean, <laughs> how open are people to that kind of thing? Because it is really holding up. Like copyright is amazing in many ways, but equally the 70 years after the death of the author, that is holding up development of the things that you're talking about. And my fear is that governments or that things will change around copyright in order to facilitate some things and that we have to have a balance. So some kind of licensing around data training models would would help. Yeah. So in policy, this is often referred to as the secondary use of data problem. Can you use data of any sort for purposes other than it was given to you? If, for example, 
I go and buy a bunch of Scalzi books from the from the bookshop, having enjoyed read and enjoyed them as I'm supposed to do, and that's in, implied in the social contract of buying books, can I then digitize it and feed his stuff into something that might eventually start to sound like him? Um, and GDPR, for example, requires that for any secondary use, the data subject or the data provider uh, be notified and explicit permission be be attained. That so that that is that actually favors the favors creators more so than the researchers. I don't necessarily have a much better solution in mind, other than like to agree with you that the seventy years after death is too restrictive. Even as an author, like that, that just feels a bit. Uh, bit too much. It, the, it's not like I can sit here and claim that every sentence I've written is 100% original, right? I am also a product of societies and what I've read. And therefore, these words are also going to rely on constructs that I have observed in the world around me and reacted to. So it's not like I'm pulling language purely out of the ether. So that is the state of things right now. Um, on the other hand, there's the problem of, um, for example, I've seen a few AI co-writing tools that are based explicitly on GPT-3. And my question to each of these people is uh, sometimes they reach out for testing and I keep asking, what's your data set? Mm. Is it in the public domain? Is it, uh, if, you're, if you're taking, if you say you've taken um, this many screenplays or this many novels, whose novels have you taken and what, what permissions do you have to do that? Because mm-hmm. there's the flip side of allow, saying, okay, fine, in the name of research, let's, let's do this, is eventually what, what is simple and harmless and fun research gets commercialized. And then you will have, because of the nature of these technologies, like I can retrain OpenAI GPT-2 on my work machine, on my home machine, actually. It's a six-core, 12-thread uh, CPU with a very powerful GPU and lots of RAM. That's fine. However, for me to re- retrain GPT-3 would take me about $12 million worth of equipment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I read, the pa- I read the GPT paper. And towards the end, they basically say, yeah, there are some, there are these parts, these parts, and these parts where you're not really sure what happened, but the cost of retraining this is too high. That's open AI saying the cost of retraining this to find out, to make our research a bit more rigorous, is too high. So this is overwhelmingly going to privilege large corporations with lots of money in the bank, lots of hardware and lots of highly paid researchers who can then do this kind of work to create a product that can be sold as a, on a SaaS platform. So the, <laughs> the problem with, I feel like I'm one of those two handed economists, like on the other hand, on the other hand, but the problem of flipping the gate the other way is you'll initially have a wave of early experimenters like me who are having fun with it. And then immediately you have monetization. Yeah, and and this is where, but I see this happening right now. So as you know, Microsoft has now licensed OpenAIs. So obviously Microsoft are going to turn this into their products. It's going to be part of, I think, Azure is their AI software as a service. So these things are going to be commercialized. And of course, as we know, the architecture transformer stuff could change to be something else and could be cheaper in the future. So I feel like we have to figure out copyright for an AI age before all this starts happening. Because the thing is, like, you've done this, you've produced a book that you've been paid for. And you because you're ethical, and you understand the copyright side of things, you've done it in an ethical way. Yes, I'd like to know that I use people who've been dead since the fifth century. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But equally, to me, there's a big problem of bias. So if you only use works out of copyright, they are generally white, dead, Christian, male, Western, So, Absolutely. And you're Sri Lankan, you know, for a start. Yes. How many Sri Lankan published authors are in your data set? Probably just No, you. I went through the Project <laughs> Gutenberg corpus of, of poetry, and there is a very easy downloadable, downloadable corpus there. What I ended up with, the, the initial generator that I built was very heavy on Christian images. Mm. It was very heavy on the themes of God kept up randomly popping up in the middle of the <laughs> You probably had a lot like, of no. Bible in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of, and there was, you know, William Blake, for example, and a lot yeah. of those 
the mm. the corpus is overwhelmingly as you say biased towards the anglosphere towards white male authors in the anglosphere and even then towards the more religious angle of it whatever was considered socially acceptable mm. in those times so yes i mean we have tremendous problems with class balance in these kinds of data sets we and so, we yeah. absolutely don't need to figure this out before shit hits the fan yeah that's exactly <laughs> and i feel like all we need like you and i are both authors i'm an independent author i own all my rights i would love to license my corpus of work uh to whatever models but i would also like to be recompensed for that so in in my head i i have this idea that using possibly some kind of blockchain technology that would feed in my data would be tagged in some way and then whatever is output from the other end let's say someone produces books out of that corpus that I would uh, receive a micro payment for whatever percentage my work was part of that training data. Is that completely (laughs) far-fetched? Oh no, actually that's very interesting because that that is technically, that should be possible within the GDPR. I'm not a huge fan of GDPR. There are certain data colonialism problems that it's kicking off in the way it's being pushed out. Uh, However, in the current structure, there is a way of doing that there are these there are these intermediaries that are the data processes. So, for example, if you and I could license our books out to these data processes, and they acquire the rights of many authors to put together a large corpora of data that then researchers or maybe even other authors can one click and download, and there's a subscription fee, a portion of which, according to our contribution in the corpus, goes to each author who pitches in. Mm. Uh, that that's is a perfect is a perfect doable one. That's and that's the model I want to happen because that I see as a way to enable this kind of creation, but also to pay the original creators. And then I was reading about synthetic data. So let's say you and I put together a corpus together, Yuda Joe corpus, and we th- we can then actually create synthetic data from that that then could also be licensed on. And thus it would give a new form of income to creators, but still benefit people who want to train and use the models to create new things true true but synthetic data is a bit a bit difficult with unstructured data so uh, the think tank that i work at we actually do a lot of synthetic data work Mm. we use it generally on phone call records across millions of people to reconstruct patterns of movement uh, economic activity so that whatever funds are coming in for development can actually be channeled to where those things are needed and where there is a need, for example, for better roads and better public transport. Uh, on the language side, because I, uh, I work with like several languages and publish large corpora in these languages, synthetic data is incredibly distinct. Uh, GPT, GPT-2 and 3 are essentially synthetic data generators. Mm. They're incredibly difficult with unstructured data, unless you happen to have an insane amount of unstructured data. Which has been open air's thing so far. They just scrape all of Reddit uh, for that first (laughs) corpus they put up. They basically we scraped all of Reddit for the top performing articles, and we followed those links through. And we took that text, and I'm sitting there going, "Wow, okay, that's a lot of copyright (laughs) violations." Like I don't even dare touch that corpus. And and that's the thing. My concern really is that, again, you're an ethical person who knows this stuff. Most people playing around with a lot of these tools don't necessarily even understand copyright, let alone care about it. So I think w- we definitely need to be engaged in this. And, and I love what you're doing. I do have one last question because we're almost out of time. But when we talk about ownership of data and ownership of books in copyright, the publishing industry actually own the most data. Mm. For example, you've got what penguin random house maybe with simon and schuster you've got some really big corpuses there do you think as a thought experiment would one of these mega publishers uh use that data because a lot of the times the contracts that authors have signed hand over data for the life of copyright could that be used in the future and do you think the publishing industry is just not that sophisticated (laughs) i'm pretty sure given the the thing about the publishing industry is it's a, it's a bunch of really large sharks. And like, I'm, I've, I, I've got a, I've got a fair bit of traditionally published workout. I've got a fair bit of indie workout. And everybody sort of says, oh, trad pub is slow to respond to this and this and this until they start seeing significant money. 
then you start seeing ebook adoption, then you start seeing publishers, then you start seeing pr- print runs being reduced, ha- higher royalties appearing on ebook, uh, on, on ebooks, and things going ebook and audio first, large amounts of money being pumped into this. So I think at some point, because they realize that there is enough money, they, this level of analysis will be done. In fact, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't already. This is speculation from my part. But it would be perfectly, um, like, I can think of several dozen use cases right off the bat. If you wanted to know what the structure of a bestseller is, you could potentially do topic modeling on, say, if you take the science fiction, say you're playing Penguin Random House and you have science fiction and fantasy, topic model your bestsellers and then find, find books that match those. So you're not just looking at the blurb, but you're not just looking at how close it right matches, but does the actual structure of words and themes represented and how they're put together inside the document itself, do they match? There's so much, there's so much other stuff that can be done. With this. I, I think so. And yeah. in fact, I wonder whether this will come out of China first, given the whether they're ahead of the US or, or not can be debated by different countries. But you and I are in the middle of those two countries. This could come out of China first. And with AI translation, I, I don't even know if we're going to know what is created. That's, by that's an the AI. I mean, I'm looking at both regulatory environments because both the US and the China are very much alike for all the narrative that they have against each other. They are both, to a certain extent, incredibly unregulated data economies. Now, China, China is passing through a Data Protection Act, which I've, which I've read the draft of. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Actually, a lot more liberal than I imagined. Mm. But in the US, for example, you have Clearview which basically scraped YouTube for faces and used that to build a facial recognition database for for police. Mm -hmm. And they're claiming that it is within their first and second amendment rights to take data thus from YouTube. YouTube, of course, is kicking up a huge fuss and these people are saying, no, it's, it's in our rights. And that is a completely unregulated environment. I have the feeling that this stuff will be coming out of the US first. The interesting thing is going to be it's it's probably not going to come from the science fiction and fantasy authors if you're looking at books that that are co-written and so on. It's not going to come out of the classical science fiction and fantasy authors that we know and follow. It's going to be someone with a programming background, probably in Silicon Valley, uh, going, hey, I'm going to write a book. And I know that there... So a lot of the a lot of the social contract around the process, the subtle, the subtle unwritten rules and norms of being a part of a community of writers are just not going to apply to them because they'll be looking at it completely from the outside and going, "How do I hack this process?" Mm. In, in fact, I've I've just done something like that. I've just I've realized I just describing myself as a bit of a sociopath. Um, <laughs> But no, you. But you have an uh, what? Uh, and what? Circling right back to the beginning, you're an artist and a programmer and a technologist. And I think how I want to end this discussion really is to say that this is too important a thing to leave to only the technologists and the artists and writers need to get involved in this. Right? We have to get involved, yes, or else we're going to wake yes. up and it, and we'll be out of the conversation. Or, or worse, we're going to wake up and it's going to be shit. Because, uh, uh, like a lot of, lot of my frustration came from reading computer science papers that were published in this machine learning fora, where they would feed increasingly sophisticated neural networks, say the first seven Harry Potter books. And then you would get some output and they would discuss it and say, oh yeah, it'll, the model loses attention after two, after two paragraphs. And the author part of me is screaming, that's not how we work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we think of characters, we think of world building, we think of plot, we think of all of these things, the emotional arcs that the reader has to go through. We think of all of these layers in parallel. We don't process this as one giant chunk. Mm. And that's, I think, that's it's critical for us to actually be involved in this because otherwise we, we'll end up with stuff like GPT-2. Uh, actually, GPT-2 and 3 are very good examples of what happens, where right? it's bordering on the unethical it's, it's even sometimes unfeasible 
it's a clearly a technological breakthrough as well. So it's, it's sitting in this awkward space of who really gets to use this and what exactly is the greater good scenario here. Absolutely. So people who want to get involved should definitely check out your books and some of the things you've written. <laughs> so tell people where they can find you and everything you do online. Right. You can find me on www.yudanjaya.com. That's Y-U-D-H-A-N-J-A-Y-A.com or twitter.com slash Yudanjaya or facebook.com slash Yudanjaya. Um, I use Twitter and Facebook quite a lot for different stuff. My Twitter is going to be language, futurism, policy, cats. And my <laughs> Facebook is going to have a lean a lot more towards cats. The order is going to be inverted. It's going to be cats and whatever other interesting things I have to say come second to cat photos. Well, thank you so much. That was so great to talk to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. So I hope you found the interview with Yuda interesting and thought-provoking. How do you feel about using AI tools to co-create and even make your writing faster and more creative in a different way? Are you excited about it? Are you scared about it? Do you frown and go, that's cheating, like we talked about? There are lots of emotional responses to this kind of thing, but uh, very interesting for sure. So I'm going to be talking to more authors in the following months about writing and creating art with AI tools. So hopefully this has started to open your mind about the possibilities. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.